bodies uh, beyond Neptune that we now realize includes uh, Pluto among its number. Uh, and it's something that I discovered in 1992 with Jane Liu uh, using a telescope in Hawaii. So the, the background to that uh, discovery was that in the 80s it became apparent that the outer solar system was just unreasonably empty. The inner solar system had, you know, planets and asteroids and comets whizzing by. Outer solar system at that time had basically nothing, Pluto and nothing. And that, that seemed a very unusual, kind of freaky situation. And so we decided to take a look and see if there might be something beyond Neptune to be found. Uh, and the motivation was that simple, just looked too empty to be true. So the search uh, continued from about 1986 um, until we succeeded in 1992 using a variety of different telescopes. And it was a search that continued in part because the technology got better as time went on. So we started with CCDs that are, by today's standards, ridiculously small. I mean, just a few hundred by a few hundred pixels. Um, and CCD sizes grew with time. Also, we moved from um, MIT to Hawaii, where the telescopes were better, and the uh, observing site was better, and computing power just grew uh, year by year, uh, eventually giving us a success in, in 1992 with the discovery of an object called 1992 QB1. So it's the first thing with an orbit uh, clearly far beyond um, anything um, any of the major planets, and actually beyond um, Pluto, which at that time was thought by many people to, to be one of the major planets, and we now have changed our views about that. So um, since that time, um, a large number of so-called KBOs have been found. There's a, a thousand known at the present time from surveys conducted mostly by people with um, very big charge-coupled device arrays. So the, the growth of the technology is certainly important, um, and it continues, and, and the rate of discovery of KBOs has just gone up, and it's going to go up um, even further in the next year or two as, uh, as new facilities come online, like the PanSTARRS survey telescope uh, in Hawaii. How, how much further out do you think we'll find objects? Yeah, there's a, there's a huge penalty. As you, as you move an object further away from the sun, it fades uh, in proportion to the fourth power of the distance. So if the, if the distance doubles, the thing gets fainter by a factor of uh, 2 to the 4 or 16. So there's a huge wall. Uh, and to combat that wall is really, really tough. So we, we, we struggle against that. Um, uh, it's the inverse square law applied twice, uh, once on the way out from the sun and then once for the light coming back from the object. So you get killed both ways. Um, we struggle against that by using larger telescopes at sites with better seeing, so we concentrate the light down to a tinier point on the detector so we get a better signal to noise, and by integrating longer. Um, so we, we, we now routinely detect things at 50 AU. We'll push that, I think, with PanSTARRS to 100 AU. Um, uh, but the more important thing for PanSTARRS is that it's an all-sky survey telescope. So it has a big field of view, and it's big enough that we can plaster the whole sky you know, every week or a little faster. So we can get repeated coverage of the whole sky to find these and other objects. And what that means is we'll remove many of the biases in the existing survey data. So, you know, people like me, for the most part, get a big telescope, which still has a pretty small field of view, and we say, where in the sky should we look? And so we maximize our chances of finding objects by plopping the field of view in the ecliptic, in the, in the mid-plane of the solar system. But actually, uh, we know already the Kuiper Belt is pretty thick, and there are probably many objects with um, quite high inclinations, which are uh, not easily detected if you look only at the ecliptic. So PanSTARRS should open up a complete survey of the outer solar system out to about 100 AU distance. And, you know, if there are big objects further away, we can see those too. So um, an Earth-sized object could be, um, could be discovered, you know, somewhere um, out to a little beyond uh, 300, 400 AU, something like that, if there's such an object there, or maybe several objects like that there. We can discover uh, Uranus or Neptune-sized uh, things um, out to maybe f five or 600, and, and Jupiter, I think, to 700 AU, something like yeah. that. So we can find um, things at a wide range of distances if they're there. The question is, are they there? And we have no idea. 
what what's the probability of uh, some asteroid uh, hitting the Earth or uh, some eccentric, uh, highly eccentric object appearing? Uh? Yeah, so impact is a major motivator for uh, for this telescope, PANSTARS, try to assess the impact threat uh, to, to the Earth. And the, the probability is, is, you know, 100% given you wait long enough. So the question is, how long do you have to wait before you get by, uh, you get hit by a serious um, object? So we think that globally devastating um, co uh, collisions, thi things that could pollute the whole atmosphere and cause a shutdown of uh, photosynthesis for a period of weeks or months or even longer, uh, things like that happen roughly once a million years when a kilometer-sized body strikes the Earth. So you could say we have, a mil you know, on the average, a million years. Um, but bodies substantially smaller than a kilometer hit much more frequently and still do a lot of damage. So a lot of damage means they may not uh, globally uh, de destroy or damage the, the ecosphere, but they could cause local damage. Local means they could wipe out a country or a few countries, um, uh, depending on the location of the hit. So um, regionally devastating impacts uh, much more frequent. Um, it's been estimated by trustworthy and reliable people that the chance of, of you dying from impact is about 1 in 20,000 over your lifetime. And uh, that's the same as the chance of you dying in an airplane crash, assuming that you fly at some average rate um, in, in your lifetime. And so if you care about dying in an airplane crash, as I certainly do, uh, and as I certainly did on the flight coming here because it was very turbulent, <laughs> then you should care, um, you should think seriously about impact. And so PANSTARS will provide uh, uh, our first and best assessment of whether some, global, uh, some regionally devastating uh, impact is going to occur in our lifetimes. How much data is generated by PANSTAR? The full telescope, um, uh, which will be finished in uh, three, three years or so is 10 terabytes per night. The, tele the, the, the uh, element of PANSTARS that will begin operation in 2007 is going to generate more like two terabytes per night. And it does it every night, um, every clear night, which is 70% of the nights on Mauna Kea, and it never stops until we run out of money to operate it. So it's just a, a growing mountain of, of uh, data, a river of, of data flowing into uh, computers and, and hopefully it's going to change the way we, we think about the time dependent uh, aspects of the sky. So we'll be very sensitive to things that vary with time or just vary position in the sky. Tell us more about your uh, where oceans might come from. Yeah, there's been, um, there's been a, a question in people's minds for a long time about the origin of the oceans. And th this question arises because the Earth uh, it's a pretty big body, pretty near the sun, and uh, probably was uh, hot, quite hot, when it formed, and probably uh, too hot to incorporate much water. The water would have been vaporized and wouldn't be trapped by the bodies that came together to make the Earth. So uh, it seems quite likely to, I think, a majority of scientists that water was added sometime after formation, and uh, the preferred location until the last uh, decade or so was, um, you know, somewhere far out in uh, one of these um, uh, reservoirs from which the comets fall. So the Kuiper Belt would be a good place um, to uh, provide icy objects that hit the Earth and deliver water. Uh, conceivably things from elsewhere in the outer solar system could do that. But we have these measurements of three comets that show that the deuterium uh, hydrogen ratio in the comets is different from, it's higher than the deuterium hydrogen isotope ratio in water on the Earth, in the oceans. Um, and that means that if you just get uh, a bunch of comets and melt them, then they actually don't look sufficiently like the oceans to be a plausible explanation. You still could have some fraction of the oceans supplied by melted comets, but it's not the dominant source, we think. Uh, and people have been looking at other possible sources, and they, they identified um, kind of icy asteroids as being a more plausible source, because the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter is ten times closer than the Kuiper Belt beyond Neptune, um, and so it's that much easier to bring objects from the asteroid belt in to hit the Earth and deliver volatiles, including water. So the, new, the newest wrinkle there is that last year, a uh, graduate student at the University of Hawaii, Henry Shea, and I discovered objects in the main belt, which are comets. So we found um, things that we call main belt comets. They're dynamically indistinguishable from 
other asteroids in the outer parts of the belt. Uh, they're about three AUs from the Sun. They are uh, observationally comets. They show a coma and a tail and you know if you didn't know anything about their orbital characteristics you only saw their their picture you'd say that's a comet. So they're physically indistinguishable from comets. So we believe that they are icy asteroids. Uh, we, we think that this ice has always been there and is periodically uncovered on these asteroids probably by small impacts. The first guess would be, well, perhaps there are actually comets from the Kuiper Belt that somehow got trapped in the main asteroid belt. And we're open to that idea, but none of the expert dynamicists who have looked at that, at that have found any way in which to trap uh, classical comets in the main belt asteroid. It just doesn't happen for various uh, reasons connected simply with dynamics and the energetics of, of the, the transfer. Um, so the, the most obvious um, suggestion, the likelihood, is that these are objects that captured ice when they formed. And uh, it's, it's primordial ice in that sense that's been protected from the heat of the sun, probably by a layer of dirt. Uh, and the dirt is periodically uh, removed by impact, exposing the ice which sublimates for a while and gives rise to the, the main belt comets that we observe. So there is the possibility that a large fraction, or maybe even all, of the asteroids in the outer parts of the asteroid belt actually are ice-containing objects and so in some sense are comets. And that's a very um, very neat and very surprising result to many people. So what, what it means is we have three places where comets can come from. One is this Oort cloud, which is this spherical shell that extends halfway out to the nearest stars. Two is the Kuiper belt beyond Neptune, uh, which was just discovered uh, 14 years ago. And three is the, the main belt asteroids themselves, which are very close uh, and just discovered to contain ice now uh, last year. Great. So, uh, what, what, how many asteroids would it take to fill up the ocean? I mean, yeah, it would take a, lo a, a larger number of asteroids um, than of outer belt asteroids than now exist to supply the oceans. So, that just means that the outer belt is not a current source of the oceans. But that's okay, because we have had the oceans for a long time, so we know the source is, pre is pretty old. Um, most likely, the asteroid belt, like the Kuiper belt, was very massive in the early days, and its mass was depleted by various uh, processes. Um, and the mass could have been hundreds or thousands of times the, the current mass. I mean, the, the amount of material in the asteroid belt is, at the moment is pathetic, right? It's smaller than uh, the, the mass of the moon. Um, um, but in the beginning, probably not so. Uh, and the, the flux of, of bodies hitting the Earth probably uh, came in associated with whatever event it was that cleared out mass from the asteroid belt. So this is the, the finger of suspicion points usually at Jupiter, which is this big guy nearby. Uh, probably Jupiter disturbed the, the, the growth of a planet in the asteroid belt and fl flung away lots of the debris there and um, a signif significant fraction of that debris came our way and may have struck us and may have delivered volatiles. Now whether that actually happened or not you know, remains to be seen, but that's the, that's the fairy tale that we have. Thank you very much. Any other points you want to make?